welcome all of you here. It is great to see every one of you and such a great turnout. We are really thankful that you're taking your time on a Saturday morning to join us. You are the most important person in this meeting. I say you as in collectively, but truly you are the reason that we are having this meeting today. Oregon is not as motivated as Southwest Washington is to fix our transportation system. They're getting a qualified <coughs> workforce and a 10% income tax on 80,000 of our residents every day who cross over the bridge to go to work. Nothing will happen until Washington and Oregon legislators sit down at a table eyeball to eyeball to identify paths forward. Please remember that no wash dot tax dollars were used to present these ideas to you. Just work by private citizens who want to help us solve the problem. But more importantly, north of the border, we have, a, we have what we call a Portland dependency, which is consistent with any metropolitan area as far as the need is concerned. And to the west, logic tells me that any increase in capacity on the I-5 corridor has to be complemented with something like 125 to 150 percent increase in throughput through Portland for whatever increase is added to the river. And quite frankly, I think that's never going to happen in our lifetime. They don't want cars. That's a very honorable position for a, for a city trying to be more of a European model to have. And if you looked at that stepping up the lines of lanes of traffic, that capacity is about the thickness of one of those lines that divide the lanes. So what's needed, if we're going to use mass rapid transit with steel wheels to move that volume of people into Vancouver as a BART-like system, you're talking something like this in this range, which is a four, five, or six car train leaving Vancouver every two to three minutes. If you're not going to add any more capacity to I-5 and the same number of people are going to move on I-5 as was predicted in the CRC and the, and the RTC, it ain't going to work. It simply doesn't have the capacity to meet future need. That's a dilemma. The only thing that I can see is some sort of a bus rapid transit system. As long as Portland doesn't want to increase capacity, you're stuck with you're stuck with buses. And a BRT system is probably the best way to do it. But we're talking BRT as as more of what would be done internationally. That's a bus every minute and a half leaving Vancouver to Portland. That's a dedicated right of way. That's its own lanes. If it's built to be convertible in the future, the rail, fantastic. Yeah. Um, what happens here? West Express connects five industrial parks, the biggest in the area. Port of Vancouver, Port of Portland here, Swan Island, Northwest Industrial, and then the Beaverton Hillsboro High Tech Corridor. We estimate that it will pull, once this, even this is complete, it will pull a minimum of a third of the traffic off this, allowing the I-5 corridor to once again flow freely. Once that flows freely, Banfield will flow better, and this, this uh, circle of here and the 405 will flow better. And when we complete this, uh, this part of it, then the Sunset Corridor will flow better, and this whole thing starts working. <coughs> Of course, we can't keep building freeways. That's why we've got to be open to other forms of transit. I started out about three or four years ago as a citizen saying, why aren't we moving forward on getting a solution to this problem? And, and so uh, I looked around for a politician that had some guts to uh, actually tackle this project. <laughs> and uh, what I ended up with was Liz. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> I'll tell you, it really does take some guts to get involved in this. The political climate, I think, is getting a little more favorable only because things are getting worse uh, in our traffic. But, but in terms of the politics and the, 
the internal uh, mechanism of, of getting a project uh, approved, it, it, it's really, really, really tough. So now we've got a over a hundred year old bridge that's been remodeled, <clears throat> which may or may not be good, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. So we've got two structures out there that, uh, that, that actually really, at this point in time, have gone probably way past their life span. And, and uh, so we need to look at, at, at something going forward. You know, our passion is to work with communities like you to build you a signature bridge. That's what we do. Like we did on the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis for $234 million. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the I-76 Allegheny River for $190 million. And currently almost finished the Brattleboro Bridge in Vermont for $60 million. In 2007, most people remember, or some people still remember, the collapse of the Minneapolis Bridge. This bridge really, when it, when it fell down, it just absolutely devastated the community. We were there. We worked with them. We permitted the project. We worked with them on an aesthetic themes about the project, we designed the project, and then we went and helped the contractor build the project, and it was completed in 11 months for $234 million. Wow. It's received 27 awards for innovation, and it's called a smart bridge because it has over 300 sensors in it monitoring the bridge. I'm going to cover real quickly the East County Bridge proposal that Linda Fig presented a couple years back. Uh, East, EastCountyBridge.com, you can find more information on it, and I'm going really fast. <laughs> um, the green alignment is the original RTC visioning study, which Kevin alluded to. This alignment basically was on 192nd on the Vancouver side and almost in alignment with 181st Avenue on the Portland side. When it crossed over the river, the concern was probably homes and residential areas. We took the alignment, we scooted it over, and we moved it out of the way and more in a commercial area, and then we also realigned the alignment for the navigational channel. The, the yellow alignment here is shown, uh, and it's the proposed alignment. It goes over the north end of the Columbia River, across Government Island, and then on the south channel, and lands on the Oregon side. The blue line here is the second phase of the project. So there's gonna have to be a connection as you, you land a bridge on the land and then connect it to I-84. That way you have your system-to-system -system connectivity between SR-14 and I-84, you have traffic capacity to move traffic. So, starting up on the high bluff on the Washington side at 192nd in SR-14, you come off a bluff basically and you have this high level bridge. It comes off at 2% grades. Now 2% grades are really good for trucks and cars and buses, um, everything moves pretty well, but what it really does is for pedestrians. It's very easy to walk and ride your bicycle on a 2% grade. Now, the bridge is a high-level bridge, but it still meets all the airport clearances for PDX. <clears throat> we have a 480-foot navigational channel, and that provides that uh, Coast Guard 300 and 144-foot clearances requirements, and that's the same clearances as the I-205 bridge. Now, we have typically 410-foot spans, and what that really does is you can see how vertically open it is and how wide it op open it is. So, um, all the vessels don't have any trouble navigating this environment. And on Government Island, what that does is it really minimizes the impacts and the number of times that you have to land. It really creates, uh, again, less, in less intrusion on, the, on Government Island. Possibly assist. The solution is going to be much more far-fetched as all the presenters have been to you, whether it's east side, west side, a combination of most, uh, a bypass going on the west side out to Ridgefield and re-intersecting again because we are continuing to grow. The route we propose, and this is called low technology, is utilizing the topography and entering in the leverage park area, bypassing and coming out on the 405 I-5 corridor. Strictly interpreting this, we have to keep the Interstate 5 bridge, and our funding proposal includes about three to five hundred million dollars to seismically upgrade the bridge. The report that was put out by ODOT, which is now off their website, unfortunately, 
says that by doing that and doing some other modifications such as traffic flow entries to the bridge on both sides that we can extend the life of the bridge substantially. Now should it be used for pedestrians or bikes or light rail or uh, rapid transit, maybe that'll be a public discussion that we'll have to go through. Uh, my name's uh, Larry Patella. Uh, Sometimes I'm referred to as uh, one of the local rabble rousers. Uh, I don't know much about uh, this engineering. Uh, my life has been uh, driving ships around the ocean, so. But I do know that as long as light rail between Portland and Vancouver is part of this deal, uh, the citizens of this city are, are not going to uh, accept it. You know. And the other thing I, I find uh, that uh, is missing from this is nothing has been said about creating some jobs here in Vancouver so they don't have to cross the bridge. Uh, recently we had... Good morning and thank you. I'm John Lee from Campus. The number one concern that should be coming out of every transportation official's mouth is the issue of safety. And there is a huge safety issue that needs to be addressed. And that is, sadly, the Rose Quarter. The Rose Quarter, according to a 2012 City of Portland study, has the highest accident rate of any section of road in Oregon. It has three times the accident rate of the Terwilliger Curves, and Oregon just spent several hundred million dollars addressing the Terwilliger Curves. This two-lane, two-mile stretch of I-5 is a safety issue that must be addressed before we do anything else. Number two, we need more corridors. What's the problem for transportation? I brought a visual aid. A funnel. How do you funnel so many cars into the core of where all the jobs are with so few lanes of traffic? Clearly, if you're bringing three or four lanes across the Columbia River, there are eight or nine additional lanes being added onto I-5. Whether it's MLK Boulevard, whether it's Swan Island, all the way into town, more people are pouring onto I-5, and yet there are fewer lanes to handle all those people pouring in. They need to fix the safety issue at I-5. The other choke point is the Vista Ridge Tunnel. Why send everything to Washington County through one three-lane tunnel each way? So let's have more corridors, more ways for traffic, and finally, Portland has a dozen bridges across the Willamette River. Why should we be limited to just two ways to cross the Columbia? Thank you very much. Getting old isn't for sensitive. <laughs> I'm Al Bauer. And, uh, I spent about 30 years up there. I spent about 30 years up in the legislature doing the kinds of things that uh, Representative Pike and others are doing. And I got to compliment her for bringing us some other alternatives. Uh, not a day went by in the legislature where, where the first idea failed. Uh, there were other ideas, and eventually we came to compromises. I'm here to speak today. Uh, Stephanie and I moved down from uh, Gig Harbor uh, in the year 2000. And the reason we left Gig Harbor was because they had an unsolicited proposal from Bechtel Corporation to build a new bridge across the Comaneros. And I, I, we moved down here to get away from bridge problems and cost of it. And guess where we came? <laughs> there we are. Um, so I, I want to say that uh, uh, at Monday night's uh, City Council, Vancouver City Council, I spoke up and I, I did vote for the measure to. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, I-5 bridge replacement. Uh, I voted for that uh, because of the fact that I wanted to have it unified, but I did give the stipulation that I wanted a third bridge first. And so I'm on record for that factor. 
I'm looking at a lot of very interesting things here, and I think we ought to continue this conversation because flooding the I-5 corridor does not make sense to me at all. There's all kinds of mobility problems and everything else. We need to take action here. I'm Kimball Edwards, and I live on Vancouver Lake. I came today to defend Vancouver Lake in the visual. We've done a lot of work in Vancouver to try to draw people to the lake. And I think looking at a freeway kind of distracts from that, as well as the waterfront. I also have a concern regarding the train tracks and the freeway. I don't mean to live in fear. I live, I live in caution. Uh, yes, we were successful in preventing the oil trains that are over a mile long coming through. <laughs> However, there are still thousands of rail cars that go through here with oil. I know because I live right there. I watch them. So, you know, it's this is not going to prevent an accident from happening. Should, caution, something happen to the railway, what happens to your freeway? Okay, so I hate the West Side Freeway idea. Honorable representatives, friends, colleagues, laureates, and John Lane. <laughs> so many good things have already been said about uh, the bridge and process of what you got going on here, so I'll be very quick and highlight. Uh, John is absolutely correct about the safety corridor down in Portland and Rose District. That's got to be addressed before anything else, and that's a real quick fix. The uh, other issues, third bridge versus an, third bridge versus an I-5 bridge. Uh, I would like to see both go on if that's financially possible. If not, I still give it priority to the third bridge. I'm going to assail the senses of some of the social engineers in here and you civil engineers who incorporate their concepts. The assumption, the assumption that we cannot build more roads is erroneous. It's unqualified. We can do anything we want. We really can. It's going to make some people uncomfortable. No, I don't care. The one symbol that we have in America of our freedom and liberty, the ability to move about and go where we want is the automobile. Get over it, people. The social engineers who are trying to force us out of our cars, it ain't happening, okay? We've come a long way in energy efficiency and pollution control. Let's keep our automobiles going. Thank you very much, girls. Love what you're doing. Hi, my name's Donna Sinclair. Can you hear me okay? Um, okay. I'm glad that I'm following that because I have spent up to two hours a day crossing the river to work in downtown Portland. Wow. I teach over there. I don't do it every day. Um, I also, because of the way that Clark County has responded to public transportation, when I did go to downtown Portland daily, um, the Tim Iman uh, bill was passed so that my bus service got cut. Um, so that I had to actually drive to go to Portland because I couldn't get home in time for my children. So I think public transportation is something that, that Clark County voters really need to think about long and hard for a sustainable future. We are not talking just about our own situation. We are talking about the future. And in the future, with millions and millions of people, we need better transportation. Hi. Quick question. $200 million has already been spent on this. What did we get for the money? <laughs> we got a pile of paper. <laughs> is, is, that all, uh, is that all publicly available? Yes, all of it's all been archived. I don't know how big that pile of paper is, but $200 million, you can imagine how tall that pile of paper is. <laughs> and so does that indicate a bad, bad leadership, that $200 million was spent and we got nothing? Well, I certainly agree with you. <laughs> and, and just so you know, too, uh, there was a version of HB 21222 Two years ago. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about a couple of the gentlemen that talked about bringing jobs here to this side of the river. I wholeheartedly agree that that would be the one of the best solutions that we could possibly have. Let's bring companies here. I attended just recently the economic forecast breakfast where there were at least three major companies that were that were at the forums that presented and what they said 
that when a business is looking to relocate to a county or to a city, they look at the transportation plan. And yes. right now, uh, this is not good. What we have right now is not good. Even if they're going to live here, they want to take advantage of some of the things that are in Portland as well. And so you have to be able to get back and forth between our communities. Our communities really are melded together. And I, I, for, I should have first thanked Representative Pike and Representative Kraft for putting this on and these wonderful presenters with great ideas, some of which are really out of the box, but a very good thought process for us to go through. I actually uh, would like to say that I am for Representative Pike's bill because I think we need to be forward-looking, not just for right now, but for the future, 15, 20, 50 years. And we do need to work with the Oregon legislature. There's no way that we can do this without working with the legislature. So I, I thank you all for coming. This is a great forum. Thanks. Hi, Darlene Johnson, North Park County. And I've been listening. We didn't get here early enough to hear everyone, but most of them haven't expressed any idea of freight mobility. We happen to own a truck line. And I'll tell you, the I-5 bridge that they plan for two million or how many dollars actually did a very disturbing distur disservice to any freight mobility. I mean, that plan was horrible as it relates to freight mobility. I am also in favor of Liz Pikeville because we need additional bridges. And you know, a lot of them are talking about the time that you spend going from, you know, to get home. We spend time all the time trying to deliver freight. And you know who pays for that? Either the consign it comes down to right all the people in this room because you can't you can't get the freight delivered in a timely manner because of the of the congestion. Will have no impact to traffic at all. <laughs> well that's exactly what the people who are saying we should do the I five bridge first are telling you. I don't believe that. I think at a minimum we should have a third bridge to alleviate any construction trouble we might have before we get to an I-5. And, and one more thing, I'm glad the lady brought up freight. I can't put my freight on off the bus. I can't put my freight on light rail. We got to put it on roads. So thank you. I want to underscore that as elected officials, we want to represent your interests when we sit down and negotiate with the state of Oregon. And that's why this exercise today was so important. So please fill out a comment card if you weren't one of the people who spoke today, because it is imperative that we represent you when we do sit down with Oregon. We will continue to listen to our citizens. Representative Kraft and I are committed to the people that we serve. There's, between the two of us, we represent 260,000 residents in this county. And I think this community forum, this visioning process that will encourage good planning for us, was really well attended, and I think people genuinely were glad they were here, and I hope you agree with me on that. We're going to do this probably two or three more times in Clark County over the coming months. And please sign up for our, our legislative newsletters that we send out electronically. It saves the taxpayers a lot of money. It's all done through the internet, through email. So please sign up and we will keep you posted on this visioning process as we continue to communicate with our district patrons over the next several months. And uh, if, you have, if you are inclined to support House Bill 1222, I will be eternally grateful because that is the only bill that has been introduced in the Washington State Legislature this session that will create a 10-year, 25-year, and 50-year plan for our region and is the only bill that looks at not just the I-5 corridor, but additional corridors to do two things, improve freight mobility and relieve traffic congestion. So thank you all for coming. I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Vicki Kraft. And again, I also want to say thank you. Obviously, as uh, the newest legislator that has joined our Southwest Washington delegation, I am quickly trying to make sure that I am hearing directly from you 
that I understand what your needs are, what you feel like is important for you and your family. You probably saw me scratching out notes up here as you all were talking. It is very important to Representative Pike and I to hear from you. This solution, whatever it is, I'll say solutions, right? We have to take a next step, but we need many steps. It's not about us. This is really about you. So this is just the beginning of a dialogue, as Representative Pike has said. We want to make sure that we know what you like, what you don't like, as I said before. Uh, all of your Southwest Washington uh, legislators need to hear from you. And so, please again, just if you have not had a chance to speak, be sure to get with Shelby, fill out a comment card, reach out to us at our offices, come by and visit locally or up in Olympia. But you are the reason that we're here and that we are working hard to get the right solution as the next step and then prioritize properly for the future. Thank you for being here. Thanks again.